So what I want to go over is chapter one with everybody. Let me just quickly prove that we're operating here. Great. That should work quite well. And I want to go back in time just briefly. And I want to get us back in the business of designing software. Now what's happened over the past few weeks, and you guys are turning in a pretty major paper today, is that you guys have undergone a lot of problem domain analysis. So if you've looked at the ecosystem of a industry, in this case, in this, this semester, it's the entertainment industry, especially as it interacts with the internet, and how the internet is powering transformation in the way that people are entertained. And we're, we're asking the question, if we change the way that entertainment is delivered and the way that, that networks work to deliver entertainment, will that change the entertainment? And so we're, we're fooling around with that. Now luckily, just in my small class here at Cal Poly, I have two dueling ideas. One of it is a sort of a Pandora of independent drama. And the other is kind of a Kickstarter of independent drama. You know? And so these young students have already envisioned how to solve this problem. Now truth be told, there are three other groups, and they have ideas too. It's just that we have a few alpha males who have come on up and they've sold me on their idea already. That's okay. We like those. You know, we're friendly to alpha males here. Um, but, uh, and alpha girls, alpha ladies, we make your presence known. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just inevitable for a few people to always seek out others and discuss their ideas. And, you know, that's good. So what I see is we've gone and done the problem domain and people have responded with a software concept. And that to me is downright interesting. Now the interesting thing, and, and I attribute this to their male DNA, is they want to just focus on getting that software done. Like they want it done. They forget your assignment, Mr. Bunt. No, they haven't said that. But they've been very polite, but they've been polite, politely bored with my assignment. And they've said, forget the problem domain. I already get the problem domain. I already get it. Now here's how you solve it. Let's get it done. Move. I like those people a great deal. And what I'm asking them is I'm going to say, okay, you guys are blessed and we like you and now here's what you need to learn. The problem domain has to actually be articulated so that other people understand the basis by which you made your decisions. It's called the business motivation model. You'll understand more about that as you go. You actually need to slow it down to the point where you can uh, crystallize what you've learned about the environment. Most likely you've learned five things. Um, one, you've learned that uh, by purchasing cable, that's what allows you to get content, and there is a vast disconnect between the producer and the audience. Two, the producer does not get market data. The, exec the executive gets market data and manages the, the, the producer. Uh, three, the internet is full of interesting examples of independent content, but the, the internet is, is built of Netflix on one side, which is kind of like a cable channel, which is a very, very high-end content, and then the other side is YouTube, which is very low-end content, but is immensely popular. It's hard to get your show on Netflix. It's easy to get on YouTube. It's hard to make money on YouTube. You know, so there's this vast um, chasm between uh, cruddy YouTube and really sweet Marco Polo on Netflix. Okay? So for us to make a model of a new software application that helps people to locate content that is tuned to their desires, we're going to have to do something that, that doesn't exist. At the same time, there are lots of interesting examples, and students have said Pandora works for streaming music. That's a disruptor there. There is Kickstarter, which is an interesting funding model. It's interesting how one student sees Kickstarter, and then the other starter sees Pandora. The other student sees Pandora. Um, we literally have that much IQ in the room that two very competing solutions would come apart, would come about. So what I want to say here is now that your problem domain is done and you have a large paper, I had a young woman say to me today that she and her team of three people authored a 25-page paper, and I'm very excited to absolutely not see my children for the next <laughs> week while, quote-unquote, daddy has work to do, you know. Thanks, guys, for depriving me of the time with my, youth, my young children. But 25 pages, that's a lot. So... I want to take a look at that, but also the 25-page paper came from the team that also has the Pandora idea. So most likely those groups that are doing a lot of problem domain analysis also have been inspired with some interesting concepts. So my job right now is to start us to get us 
into the software game where how do we translate the, the business analysis, right, the first two years of your Cal Poly education into the next two years where you talk about software architecture, right? And so this is an important sort of uh, pass-through class. Um, this class will bridge the, all your core business uh, with all the next two years, which is all your core tech. Um, so let's go with this first slide. So that's my warm-up. Now you're on the first slide. SDLC, Systems Development Lifecycle, it's the overall process of developing information systems through a multi-step process. There are many known software development methodologies. Four fundamental phases are the planning, analysis, design, implementation. So let me ask you this. What stage are you in right now? What did you just get done with? You're really into this planning and analysis phase. I'd argue that that's very true. Um, so SDLC is really about process and deliverables. The process of planning engages a project plan. And let me just say this. These are going to be things that you're going to do this, this term. Your analysis will, will engender a system proposal. Your design will create a system spec. And your implementation will have a new piece of marketable software right, that will hit market. Um, you have a few methodologies. Now, a methodology, and that should be a word that you should start to use more, is a formalized approach to implementing the SDLC. There's a number of them. Some well-known methodologies include waterfall, there's parallel system prototyping, throwaway prototyping, extreme prototyping, and the rational unified process. Um, waterfall is really for systems that have been done before. And what we want to do is we want to make a system like another system inside of a new uh, organization or context. And for, for me, the, uh, the example is enterprise uh, resource planning, you know, which is a type of system that kind of pulls together all of the industrial components of a company, enterprise resource planning. Um, to make an ERP means to follow certain processes so that one ERP for this, in, in, you know, a, this in, uh, manufacturer is similar to an ERP in another. And so there's a lot of packaged software that is deployed on a gradual basis. Now here, your planning, analysis, design, implementation, and system, they, they, they operate in order. And you roll them out, and it's well known how we do these kind of things. Nowadays, um, I was watching a Chelsea Handler show on Netflix over the weekend, very funny, where Chelsea does Silicon Valley. And she actually spends much of the show visiting with a app producer in Silicon Valley called Yeti. And she said she has a fun idea for an app and they end up producing the app for her. And the truth of it is, is a firm like Yeti, in the case of Chelsea, would have produced these apps before. And because they've produced it before, they have well-known waterfall-like rubrics for producing a similar piece of software. Hence the similarity between apps. There are a million apps out there. Many of them have similarities. And that's because we have a waterfall method to produce similar things. Now, that's a little bit different. You guys have been engaged perhaps in a parallel where you're planning an analysis and then is done in a linear way. And you guys are working in a linear way where your analysis derives from your planning. But then your design phase breaks off, and you have many different versions, or you have many different sub-projects or subsystems that have to pull together. So for example, maybe you have a user experience where you have uh, user interfaces that you make, and you have a designer, and you have the people making the gorgeousness, and the human factors, and the human computer interaction people up top here. Then maybe you have a design and a security and authorization team that is really looking at offering very secure cloud computing APIs to people. That takes time. And then thirdly, you may have a group that is really about the machine learning and are not so much engaged with the real-time production-oriented software as they are the, um, the artificial intelligence, the knowledge discovery, the kind of Netflix like algorithms that discover uh, new patterns. And those are three different teams. But as we pull them together, you get a Twitter where there's a user experience on top of a secure computing architecture that is home built, by the way, um, at, at Twitter. And then you have an impressive machine learning uh, regime that pulls it together and makes meaning of the inputs. So those teams are often working together. Um, now, when you're operating in a phased way, this breaks an overall system into a series 
of versions and develops them sequentially, so one after the other. And the most important and fundamental requirements are included in the first version, and then they design and they implement it. And after version one is implemented, your work in terms of analysis, design, and implementation begins on version two. Um, some advantages here is you're quickly delivering a useful system to users compared with a waterfall or a parallel where with the waterfall you need to get done with all this. With the parallel, you really, it's going to take a little bit of time before something pulls together. And then a phased, you're going to have something that you can show something to users to get their feedback. Frankly, and, and you guys need to learn about this, when you're a technical person, you're going to deliver your work to non-technical people and then all sorts of feedback uh, that will come back that perhaps you hadn't anticipated. And that will change the direction of your work. In our opinion here at Cal Poly, uh, technology always follows these corporate strategic objectives. Um, we're do, we don't do things just because we want to have technology, quite the opposite. We have the technology because we want to do certain things. So your job is enacting that corporate strategy. So we take our work and we talk about it with the business people, they give us some feedback. Um, you know, the, because the users work with the system sooner, they're more likely to identify additional and important requirements sooner, but users begin to work with an incomplete system and they tend to comment on its incompleteness as you go. Um, but usually every time you sit down with a prototype, you get something done because your user gives you some insight that helps to push it forward. Now, you guys here are very interesting. I always think that CIS is this interesting group because you're not purely technology. You have a business element that, frankly, you see things from a business perspective. And maybe you're stronger on the business because, frankly, business is a lot more obvious. Business is more arithmetic. It's easier to get. It doesn't require deep training. You know, uh, it, versus the technology, it takes, frankly, thousands of hours to understand how something will react. It takes more time. There are dr dramatically less electrical engineers, for example, than there are uh, business people. You know, business is the most prevalent discipline. Um, most people get their college degrees with it. The tech people, there's only a tiny group who do that. So, um, so then we have system prototyping, where our planning goes into analysis, design, implementation. But a lot of this is finished by developing a prototype that helps us to accomplish analysis, design, implementation through uh, comment and review. So if I can say something, maybe you guys will watch Chelsea Does Silicon Valley on Netflix, you know, and I'm not going to sign his homework, but perhaps if you want to, you know, quote unquote, Netflix and chill, this might be a fun one. <laughs> you know, if I can re recommend a very CISE Netflix, uh, that's, um, uh, that's definitely Chelsea to Silicon Valley. Um, what she does is she pitches this, this idea to the app developers, and the app developers come about with a prototype. And frankly, Chelsea knows what she wants from the app. She has her own series of recommendations. The programmers are quite elite, and they can do something very few other people can do, and they see things differently. And so she is able to kind of give some important feedback that helps to steer their work in the right direction. You know, you realize that you know a Chelsea who is you know this uh, you know hilarious but real world person is going to need the presence of these elites to get anything done. Um, but these elites are going to benefit from the presence of you know somebody as scattered as Chelsea, you know who can represent you know the quotidian pedestrian person. And so her feedback in the prototype is what allows them to get something done that's impressive. Right? It's that combination of people. Now, let me say this. Chelsea Handler has got to be one of the most brilliant comedians that, you, that can walk, talk, and chew gum that's alive today. You know, uh, but uh, ask her to code, and she'll probably say, can I please do some stand-up instead? You know, Chelsea never you know, made, made a dime through coding. You know, so um, you know, just, just to put things in perspective. So the implementation is really a dialogue between people looking at your prototype, kicking tires, and then finally getting it out to the street once we have some level of confidence, right? Now, throwaway typing, um, it's called a, a design prototype. The design prototype is used to get requirements and interact with the project team. Um, it'll be a throwaway because the prototype is only a mock-up and not a high-quality real system. And in web development, we call it wireframes. 
And the better your wireframe, the more people can give you feedback before you end up doing the hard work of coding something. This might be liberating. If I were to take a straw poll of the class and say, how many of you want to be developers? Probably one out of 30 will say developer. And it, it's just because people don't, there are very few people who identify with the developer position. I'm of the opinion that, you know, in the future, the business school idea may be made semi-obsolete because of the presence of developers who, frankly, are making businesses without the help of MBAs. Um, you know, that's, that's kind of the Uber idea, which are, you know, it's really a bunch of programmers who are thinking about how to make new businesses. It's, it's a matter of time because business is relatively easy um, once you have trained as a programmer. You know, it's lightweight. You know, uh, there's very few, you know, it's not like Mark Zuckerberg ever did a Harvard MBA. Does that make sense? You know, that's an important prototype. You know, and, it, and though I, I know plenty of Harvard MBAs and they're in control of so many things. You know, this is not to criticize any MBAs. But it's really interesting when you get programmers involved because they know what the tech can do. You know, the MBA, you know, is, is going gonna, is gonna to struggle with that. Um, so... The wireframe, though, is something that can be made and discussed before you actually dive in and make it. So instead of struggling with making the technology, you can actually get some sign-off from the, the real people in the room, you know the, 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 you know, the business people in the room. So some advantages here is it allows you to refine key issues before a system is built and produce more reliable systems. And the disadvantage is it may take longer to deliver the final system as compared to more prototyping. Prototyping is going to be really interesting. But let me say this. A wireframe can be done in a few hours. A prototype needs weeks from a very good programmer. So the wireframing ultimately kind of wins out. Um, so now Extreme, or XP, uh, is based on four core values. Communication, simplicity, feedback, and courage. Courage, you got to love that. Uh, analysis, design, implementation phases are performed iteratively. Um, and which means that we, we do it gradually. We do it in a stepwise fashion. It's not done in a big lump. It, it, it works better with small projects where there are less than 10 people who can gather around a, a board and talk. And frankly, if you speak with Mark Zuckerberg, you know, who is, will have tales to tell, you know, who has plenty of story, you know, stories to tell. Initially, Facebook had teams, by the time they did IPO, very few of their, their product teams had more than 10 people at a time on it. So they're all small teams, you know, working at Facebook. Um, and that was just a very organic decision. Now, some advantages of the, of the extreme is that it's, it very quickly delivers a system with limited features. The dis disadvantage is it requires many frequent communications, such as users providing feedback and answer questions between the project team and users. And thus, it is for small projects. Now, a good example of extreme programming is you say, okay, we have an app, and in the case of um, Chelsea Handler, and I want you to get a laugh. This is intended to make you laugh. She says, look, here's my story. I sit down on a date. And Chelsea's unmarried as of the show. I don't know. She could have been married now, but she was unmarried during the show. And she says, I sit down on a date, go out a, lot, go out a lot of these dates, and then I find the person to be quite boring within the first five minutes, and I want my text, I want my phone to begin to blow up that in simulating a crisis from a friend elsewhere that I suddenly have to attend to. And I said, I got to go, thus ending the, um, the intolerable date. And so the, the product is called Gotta Go. And, uh, and she did it. She actually made this, this app with these developers and where they actually create a narrative ahead of time. And they configure the text messages. And so she wants to look at a text. She wants to look at a phone that apparently has four or five notifications on it that say things like, Oh no, the pipes broke. Or Rover ran away, or something that needs attention right then and there. Or Code Red, or she's flatlining! Exclamation points. And oh no, I gotta go. And so you actually craft them ahead of time. And so the developer said, Great job, Chelsea. We can totally make that. So after some minor tweaks, they actually made it happen. They scheduled the notifications locally from the phone, and, and it makes it look like there's this crisis. And Chelsea's like, I gotta go. So, you know, that's extreme programming where somebody bright, like a Chelsea, comes up with a cool idea that the programmers say, well, yeah, great idea. Okay, this is how we craft the architecture to support this interesting idea. 
right? So you actually need to be in the presence of a social thinker. You know, here's Chelsea who identifies a social problem, i.e. the awkward date. And let's engineer toward that. So here's how you guys need to be, you guys and girls need to be thinking. We say guys and we really mean everybody, um, depending on how, how PC you are. Um, you need to kind of grab the right methodology. So if, you're un, if your user requirements are unclear, you know, prototyping, throwaway prototypes, and extreme programming work very well, right? If your technology is something you haven't used yet, like you're, you've just ordered up your new pair of Google Glass and you don't know the API and you need to really experiment and you don't know whether Google Glass is what you want anyway, uh, you need to work with throwaways. And we start down a road and maybe that's not what's going to happen. You learn from it. If you have very complex systems, throw away. Reliable systems, throw away. You need to stress test them. If you have a short time schedule, you might go phased or with a prototype. Or if you need to, if your schedule uh, needs to be extremely visible, you go with the prototyping. Now it's interesting how prototyping solves so many problems, has solved so many scenarios. Um, but it's just a way that if you're managing or you're serving as the conduit between business thinkers and programmers or technologists that you might be thinking about, well, let's prototype this thing. Let's just get something done that gets conversation and we'll design around the finished work, right? So that's a safe way. Now, when we have object-oriented um, uh, architecture and design, you know, working with Java you know, classes or Objective-C classes, um, object-oriented analysis design, sorry, you're going to be decomposing by concept where you're breaking a large system into progressively smaller classes or objects that are responsible for some part of the problem domain. You're producing conceptual components or classes and these concepts uh, for a library, for example, would include, you know, a book, a patron, a library, you know, a librarian. These are things that you can model and naturally you can make a Java class out of each of these things with, you know, the, var the member variables and methods associated with each. Um, now, the unified process or the, it works like this, where you have these workflows, where you have these peaks in your work cycle. You go with the, bu the business modeling, which you've done, which is proper to do at the beginning of the problem, right? You're, you intensify this work and it trails off to very little. Then your requirements come after your business is modeled. You know, so you guys are wrapping up your problem domain. Some of you have very good ideas, right? Now your analysis begins to mount up at that point because once you have a concept, you can begin to analyze that. And then, of course, you get finished with that. Then your design or what, you know, what should the look and feel be, your implementation. So you have these tra this trailing off effect of high peak labor. And then that will end with testing and then deployment toward the end. And, of course, let me say this. Many of you are, are operating with the IT mindset, you know, the sysadmins. Network admins, security analysts, you know, uh, audit people, you know, database people, infrastructure. We have a vast majority of people preparing for those disciplines here. Deployment is when that all begins to kick in, but all of that needs to be designed before we get to deploy toward the end of things. And then the supporting workflows, so configuration and change, project management, environmental construction. This is what we do a lot of here at, C at CIS. Uh, these begin to mount up toward the latter part of the, of the, uh, of the project. I, I normally like to think that the cloud needs to kind of be in place on the beginning of, of, it, of uh, implementation. You know, the cloud needs to be there at the beginning so that you're not kind of sealing up the security element at the very end. You're kind of working with the security element as you go. So really on the last day, you've already tested the security piece so many times because otherwise you're going to have to delay a lot as you secure the system. You, know, you may need to decompose the system if you haven't you know, secured it early on. So here's a, a profile of a typical project showing the relative sizes of the four phases of the unified process. So here's a, a graph about how many resources you're spending is on the vertical axis, And here's your time phase as you go um, uh, laterally. So your inception is quite cheap. Your elaboration, you begin to spend more. Your construction is expensive. That's danger time right there, where the programmers are going to be expensive. Um, there's no programmer who works for cheap. It's just not. It's just not in the cards. You know, people.
get paid what they're worth. And then in their transition and testing, you ramp down a little bit, but your expenses are going to be high. So when you think about the graph of investment, really the better a job you have at inception will really frame the resources that you have to spend throughout the rest of the project. So in your problem domain analysis, it's cheap for you guys to investigate the business landscape because the last thing you want to have happen is to deploy something and then be disciplined by the market because you weren't aware of something. You need to sort of know what the really problematic pieces of your market are before you go and march right in into it. So if you take a year of just talking to people, that will actually make for a very fast development of workflow. Because in the end, it's not really about getting a project done, it's about the, the amount of time between when you start and when you begin to make money, right? Money is oxygen. It's not something that, you know, the capitalists have. You know, like even if you become a, you know, a Bernie Sanders socialist, socialism takes a lot of money. Socialism requires uh, capital to be present, right? It's just a decision on how much of that capital to amass and then how to deploy it. You know, that is a project in itself, you know. Um, so, um, so, yeah. So here's you guys. You know, you guys are easily walking into, you know, business analysis roles. We do a lot of problem domain, you know, analyzing the key business aspects of the system, identifying how the system will provide business value, designing the new business processes and policies, right? This is a full-time job. The system analysis, identifying how technology can improve business processes. What a great job. What an interesting job. Guess how the millennial walks into a company and immediately begins to think about how process can change, right? Because you guys are just digital to the core. You're thinking, why can't I do this over my iPad? Or why can't I do this over my, because the digitalia is, is such a part of your um, lifestyle, more so than in other people, you know? Though we're catching up. Um, designing new business processes, designing the information system, ensuring the system conforms to various standards. That's the systems analyst. They will keep you busy in this. And let me, let me recommend this to you. There are the big four consulting firms that are always parked outside this campus. You know, the, the PwCs, the KPMGs, you know, the substantive um, consulting firms. Um, after kids take this class, they're applying to those firms and they're getting those jobs. Okay, and we'll talk more about those encouraging stories. Now, the, most likely our kids do well because the KPMGs are rigorous people. They want to see a lot of things. You need to interview well. You need to be a nice person. You need to be comfortable with teams. Um, you know, clubs here are great training. Um, but I find that they also want you to write um, case studies. So they really want you to write a lot in order to get those jobs. And they should. You know, good, good tech firms, uh, people are able to write well because the instructions for building tech are so dense and hard to grasp that you need to encapsulate your messages within some written uh, document, some manifesto, or Here what we need, here's what we need to do. And so they need to see that you're comfortable with written communication. So frequently the KPMGs, the Price Wirehouse Coopers, they've said to people, um, okay, take 48 hours and do a business case, and here is a case study, and we'll email it to you, you receive it, and you go ahead and you, you start to take it apart, and you do what you do in this class, where you do problem domain. Now, let me say this. This class is engineered more and more so that a, a young person can do the Venn. They can do the value stream. They can do the Kanban. And then they can um, do an organization on a DFD. And then if you're presenting that to people in the, in the, in the first five pages, you're going to win that case study. Because the USC people don't get to talk about those concepts until MBA. So already, you've hacked that process. Because you've learned, Venn, is that that hard? Is value stream, is that that hard? Can't we talk about that with a young person? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, organizational chart, uh, is that that hard? No. Uh, so now you've learned it. So you begin your analysis with those things. And then you, in the next few weeks, you're going to learn how to supplement that with a corporate strategic and then a, a software response. Software that fulfills corporate strategy right now is kind of like the holy grail. And the folks at Stanford, MIT, they are very focused on that right now. But they don't want to give those secrets away. So we need to make our own sort of patented blend here 
in the Pomona Valley. We need to make our own kind of thesis for how that's supposed to work. Now, infrastructure analyst, ensuring the system conforms to infrastructure standards is uh, secure, right, resilient. I, I, he or she identifies infrastructure changes required by the system. Change management, um, developing and executing a change management plan. Um, a user training plan, that's full-time work, you know, to be an evangelist within a corporation. What's interesting about a change management person is, say the software developers create a brand new system, software changes culture. That's what we know. Um, when software gets in the room, culture changes. If you want to complain about the change in, attempt, in attention, it's because your phone is blowing up. If you didn't have your phone, you wouldn't be distracted as much, right? Now, luckily, on the reverse of that, you can also follow through with your own agendas much better with a smartphone that is telling you what, what's happening. Like if you wanted to follow some crisis somewhere and you were involved in that crisis, you wanted all the news updates you could, well, you will stay abreast of that, right? But with your phone blowing up. So I don't really mind people having phones, but it's just kind of important to know that when software gets in the room, culture changes, right? Um, and so the change management analyst is the person who goes around and trains people how to use the software given the understanding that, look, your, your job's going to change. The way that you make money is going to change. You know, uh, this software changes consciousness and awareness. Therefore, you work with a new status of information. Change management. Um, project manager, PM. Change manager, great job. All these are just A-grade jobs, right? Guess which job is growing a lot? Systems analyst. And guess which job is shrinking? infrastructure analyst and they're they're both one is growing because the other is shrinking because more programmers can boot up um, you know virtual machines more programmers can be in control of the cloud and so the demand for new software is going up when programmers can can do all the network and systems administration very easily and the system basically does all the stuff that a DBA used to do you know it does it does I was a DBA the systems do it for you you know, um, this, the programmers become more productive and organizations are saving money. And so what they do with the excess money is they ask for more software projects. So, for example, uh, Duke is moving their entire IT infrastructure to Amazon Web Services. And they're finding that everything is still going to work the same way that it used to work, but they're going to be better uh, able to manage the inflow of requests for new systems. You know, Duke is an Ivy League school for all intents and purposes. It's one of the little Ivies. You know, it's like an Ivy League school with sports. You know, a little joke there. Um, you know, at least basketball. Uh, but Duke is an interesting place because Duke's uh, uh, aim in life is to be a Stanford. Right? Stanford probably does the best job by creating software for every process that runs within Stanford. You'd think that they would do that because they have so many programmers that live and reside. There's all these system analyst people in Silicon Valley, Palo Alto. But Duke has said, look, we're going to put the, the entire university on the cloud, so we're going to be able to make so many more systems. And so it's good to think about that. Now, the networking that you're going to learn here is very software-defined networking. So what we're trying to do is we're just trying to put people into very, very high-demand networking jobs you know, and assist admin on these kind of clouds that frankly are in high demand. The truth of it is it's more likely for you guys to go work at Amazon Web Services after this education because you will have such a thorough sysadmin um, background in a software-defined networking. It's more likely for our people to work at big networking companies than in the past because big networking companies are going to offshore billions and billions more of their work to Amazon Web Services. You know, where frankly, you can put an Active Directory uh, uh, index, you know, you can put a domain uh, controller up in the cloud and just configure it from your desk without having a local network. And so what will happen is you, you will configure your desktop PCs to point to that, that remote domain controller you know, that may not be on your premises. And frankly, Amazon can keep things more secure than most of us can. You know, so... What's interesting about that is that the systems analysis jobs are, I'm not going to say exploding, but it's easy for people to walk out of this class into corporations where, frankly, they have 
more openings for system for systems uh, analysis than they have applicants. You know, so I had a student walk back in and he said, who is just a good student, you know, he said, look, thank you so much. I just got a job as a systems analyst. I'm thinking, well, that's fantastic. I'm so pleased to hear this. You know, this guy could probably be whatever he wanted to be. But it, it kind of, but he's not even graduated yet here. You know, and he already has probably what I would consider is probably a, you know, maybe a seventy-five, eighty thousand dollars job in OC. You know, and I'm thinking, well, that's good that you're working um, before you're even graduated. You know, within a few months of taking this class, that must point to some kind of need that that wasn't there a few years ago, because it's a little bit unheard of to get a graduate level job kind of in the middle of your junior year. That's pretty cool. So that's an area of growth. Then, of course, project manager is always in demand. You all would make excellent pro pro uh, project managers because um, we need people who can operate between the CEO types who are complaining, 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 and realizing, realizing, realizing that they're in trouble, 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 and then the tech people who need to hear that information, they need to, need to hear that interpreted version of the CEO. Does that make sense? You know, so these are some, some roles that we see the CIS people getting into. Very good. So let's close that down right there and allow you guys to walk around.